want to thank the uh, praise team for their music today. It was good to see Roberta. It's nice to see new members. And I'm sure from week to week we'll be seeing some new members as well. Uh, let me apologize for the sad shape of the bulletin. Uh, it's a very long story, and uh, I will not bore you with it. Uh, but uh, it, uh, and it's caused a lot of grief. Uh, but you have uh, a bulletin in black and white in front of you, and it is, and it is accurate, and I'm, I'm glad for that. We also had some problems getting the PA system up and running just right. Thanks to everybody who got that working for us. And uh, we're happy to be in the Lord's house and worshiping him today. And uh, as we start, let's ask the Lord for another word of blessing. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would be with us here today. Uh, may the angels uh, impress our minds and our hearts. May the Holy Spirit uh, give us guidance. And uh, may we uh, receive a blessing because we've looked into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today's uh, a sermon a title is Doing God's Work in Satan's Society. And uh, this, uh, the text that I uh, am using for this is uh, Luke uh, 10, uh, verses 2 and 3. And in Luke 10, 2 and 3, this is not the usual gospel commission. Uh, the usual gospel commission is in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And this is the one that we quote all the time when we uh, talk about the work that we're doing. And the traditional one is, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even till the end of the age or the end of the world. And so this is what we take as the gospel commission. But in the, in the life of Christ, when he was here on this earth, he sent out 70 of his disciples two by two, and he gave them a commission. And it's a little bit different uh, from the one that we're familiar with, but I want to dwell on this one because it has some interesting features, and it'll give us a, a basis for some discussion. And so in Luke 10, verses 2 and 3, and he's speaking to the uh, 70 uh, d disciples here, uh, then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, and, uh, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way, and behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. And so let's look at this uh, commission that uh, Jesus gave his disciples. He first off said, the harvest is great. And uh, just we were reminded of this this last week because the population of the world reached 7 billion. And uh, that's, an, that's an amazing uh, uh, accomplishment. It took about 4,000 years from the time of the flood until we had our first billion. Uh, when I was born and a young boy going to school, the population of the world was two billion. And in my lifetime, it has mushroomed from two billion to three, four, five, six, and seven. It only took 13 years to go from six billion to seven billion. And this is our harvest field. And it is a much bigger and daunting mission today uh, than it was when I was a boy. So unless the Lord comes quickly and enables us, uh, it's going to be a daunting task, uh, task to finish the work. It's not within our power to do it. It is going to be God that's going to have to give us the strength and special capabilities and special ministry to do this. And then uh, Jesus makes the point, the laborers are few. Well, Jesus had 12 apostles and he sent out 70, uh, and uh, that seemed like a pretty good number uh, to me. But if you look at the population just of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, we are very fortunate. I remember when we reached our first million, and we thought that was a wonderful accomplishment. We now have 17 million members around the world. We're the fastest growing church in the United States and the fastest growing church around the world. And uh, so the Lord is adding numbers. But if you divide 17 million, assuming that we were all earnest workers, 
And I have a feeling we're not. <laughs> you know, maybe only one in 20 is an earnest worker. Maybe only one in 100 is an earnest worker. But if you divide 17 million into 7 billion, uh, uh, truly the challenge is, is really, really great, isn't it? Uh, then the advice that is given in this message is pray to the Lord of the harvest. And I think that is an important admonition. Uh, as we look at the task, we cannot do it in our own strength. We need to pray for the Lord to the Lord of the harvest. And it's interesting that we are not to pray for strength uh, to do more than we have done thus far. We are not to pray for strength to be able to stay awake 24 hours a day so that we can uh, give the Lord uh, an awful lot. I, I remember when I was in college working with a, a call porter who was our district leader and uh, he would meet us at six in the morning to go out. He'd stay with us till 10 at night. Then he would drive most of the night to meet the next people. He had a real intensity about him. And we used to say, you know, why, why, why are you so driven? He said, well, if you knew for sure that the Lord was coming in 20 years and that was for sure, you would just be on fire for the Lord. He says, I don't know. Maybe I only have 20 years left of my life. And he said, so for me, the Lord will be coming in 20 years. And uh, unfortunately, he was killed in a car crash uh, a couple of years after that. And I thought, wow, uh, what a wasted life. Uh, he burned himself out for the Lord. I'm sure the Lord will reward him in eternity, but he could have had many more years of service. So the prayer, you see, is not for more intensity. The prayer is that the Lord would send more laborers. And so we are to work to the best of our ability. But if we're shorthanded, we don't have to burn the candle at both ends. So the prayer before you go out is that the Lord would send more laborers uh, into uh, the harvest. And then the next phrase uh, in Luke 10 is, go your way. And I, I like that because in the other gospel commission, it uses the same word, go ye therefore and teach all nations. And uh, uh, when the widow went to uh, Elisha to ask what should be done, and uh, the word was go. And so uh, there is action that's needed. Uh, the Lord doesn't want us to sit here uh, on Sabbath. This is not our work. Uh, this is our preparation. Our work is what we do when we're not here. And, uh, and I will just give another plug for our TV ministry. Yesterday uh, afternoon, uh, Jim Ogden and I filmed another episode of our Triumph Over Tobacco series. And I'm really grateful to those who were here to support us. Uh, there were people here who took time off from their regular work uh, to be here so that we could do this as a team. And uh, I, I'm really grateful for that. Uh, and it's a sign that we have a dedicated crew and, and God is blessing us. We are going and we are doing and God will certainly bless our uh, efforts. Then the next uh, phrase is, uh, go your way, I send you out. And that is a reminder that we're not going in uh, on our own volition. It is Christ that is sending us out. So when you go to do some missionary work for him, you're not going on your own. You are going because Jesus is the one who's sending you out. Uh, he's sending us out. So we're about his business. So if we have an adverse experience, if somebody turns us down, well, they turned him down. If somebody gets upset with us, well, they got upset with Christ. If they get angry with us, well, they got up angry with Christ. And if we're called upon to give our life someday, well, they took his life. And the truth is, he doesn't ask us uh, to do anything that he hasn't already done for us. He's already walked in that way. And so when we go forth to do his work, it is really he who is sending us, and we are going on his mission. And then it says, I send you out as lambs among wolves. That's not in the other gospel commission. That's only in this Gospel Commission, but I think it applies to us as well. I send you out 
as lambs among wolves. This doesn't sound like a very even matchup to me. Uh, ordinarily, lambs and wolves don't mix very well. Uh, lambs and wolves have different eating habits. And <laughs> they have different diets. And uh, meat makes wolves aggressive and ruthless. And grass makes lambs <laughs> gentle and uh, tender. And uh, it's my observation, I want to spend a little time dwelling on wolves because we need to be prepared to know what the wolves are like and uh, what we might expect uh, from them. Wolves are hard to reach with the gospel. It's hard to teach a wolf to be a lamb. It requires some horrendous changes on their parts. And there are some serious problems that come out. And one of the problems with wolves is that, number one, they're too busy. And uh, that makes it hard uh, to get their attention. In Daniel 12, 4, we're told about the end of time. And it says, at the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And, and the to and fro somehow reminds me of freeways. People coming this way at 70 miles an hour, people going that way at 70 miles an hour. It seems that if they got together and changed their works, they could just stay where they were, and everything would be all right. And, uh, but no, and airplanes are flying this way, and there's just as many planes flying that way. And at any moment, there are 4,000 planes in the air. It's just really uh, amazing. These are people running to and fro. This is the way wolves are. They are just too busy. And then uh, wolves are overextended. They, they are stretched a little bit too tight. They are overextended financially. And uh, they are drowning in debt. And uh, that's, uh, the country's drowning in debt. Uh, the largest county in Alabama declared ba bankruptcy this last week. The country of Greece is about to declare bankruptcy. Italy may declare bankruptcy. Uh, we, we're piling up uh, debt by trillions of dollars a year. We're overextended. And uh, so it's not only true of wolves, but it's true of wolves that run the country. Uh, they just overextend themselves. And then wolves are too serious about politics. And uh, there is just a frenzy of politics. And the uh, election uh, is actually a whole year away. And it's amazing. If you watch the news, you hear about Herman Cain's escapades. And uh, Rick Perry's stumbles are uh, in the headline. And lambs are more concerned about promoting Jesus than they are about politicians. And there, there are people who feel that we need to spend more time uh, electing the right kind of politicians, otherwise the nation's going to be going down the drain. But the truth is, uh, right politics will never change the country. It is God's influence in the lives of individuals that changes individuals. And as individuals are changed, then society becomes better. Uh, you, you just can't fix it by fixing uh, politics. And uh, wolves are excessively devoted to entertainment. And uh, so you have the whole Hollywood scene. Uh, uh, and you have people chasing after stars and what they're doing and what they had for breakfast. And, Kim Kardashian's uh, wedding uh, only lasted for 72 days. Lindsay Lohan went back to jail. And uh, somehow this is important. Uh, somehow this is interesting. You know, lambs uh, are concerned about stars, but they're concerned about the stars in their crown and uh, winning individuals to the Lord. And uh, stars will be in their crowns. And then wolves are too seriously devoted to sports. And uh, baseball has uh, uh, passed by. Uh, we're in the football season now. And I, I do know that the basketball season is not going to take place. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there's still hockey, and uh, nobody cares about soccer. Uh, but, <laughs> but frankly, lambs uh, don't care whose name's written in the Ring of Honor. Uh, lambs don't care whose name uh, is in the Hall of Fame. Lambs worry about whose name's written in the Book of Life. And that's what we're concerned about 
and that, that should be our uh, primary focus. And wolves are too seriously devoted to television. There's NCIS and Desperate Heart Housewives and Law and Order and Hawaii Five-O. These things are not real. These things are not real. They do not take place. Uh, these things are shadows. These are mere shadows on the screen, and we're devoted to shadows. And uh, uh, lambs uh, keep the law, which is a shadow of good things to come. Hebrews 10.1 uh, says, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come. And I, I think that's an important new way for me. I, I had not thought of that before. But one of the nice things about the law is that in God's kingdom, everybody will be law-abiding. There will be no lawbreakers. And so when we read the Ten Commandments and we say, isn't it wonderful if society would be that way? There is a society that is that way. And that's a society that I've joined, and it's a place where I'm going. And the law is a shadow of good things to come. And so we're not concerned about shadows on the shadow box. We're concerned about the shadow of things to come, which are good things, uh, which are described in the law. Wolves know too much. And this is brought out in that text in Daniel as well. Daniel 12, 4, where it says, At the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And uh, that uh, wolves think they know it all. And uh, science trumps the Bible. And uh, because I believe in science and the scientific method, uh, I don't need the Bible. Because all the truth that I need, I can prove scientifically. And I, I'm a scientist. I, I know how to read the scientific literature. There's a lot of wonderful stuff in there. But there's nothing in scientific literature that will save you. Nothing in scientific literature that will make you a better person. And um, there's a lot of truth in scientific literature. And I use it in my lectures all the time. But good information doesn't change behavior. You know, there are people that know what they need to do, but they can't do it. And they can't do it because you can't do it without the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And so this is why science, uh, people who are devoted to science, have an incomplete experience. But because knowledge has been increased, many people don't want to have anything to do uh, with the Bible. Wolves also do not want to be bothered. They just don't want to be bothered. And a good example of this comes from Acts 24:25 where Paul was speaking to Felix. And Felix answered and said, Go away for now, and when I have a convenient time, I will call for you. And, I, and this is what we'll say. I, I can't be bothered right now. I'm just too busy right now. I, I'm involved with this right now. And, and maybe another time. Well, another time never comes. And uh, that's just the sad fact of it. Because uh, wolves say learning about the gospel would upset my life. I've got too many commitments right now. I might have to give up something. It would upset my current belief. I can't take on any more responsibilities. And so they put off the gospel. Another characteristic of wolves nowadays is that wolves are angry. And they are ruled by emotion. This is why in the last few years we've heard about road rage. And the shortest measurable period of time is not a nanosecond, but the time between the time a light turns green and the horn behind you <laughs> goes beep, beep, beep. <laughs> and that's because people are angry. And they will honk at pedestrians in the crosswalk because they're just not moving fast enough to get across the street. People are upset at long checkout lines. They run up and down, seeing if they can find a shorter line. And that's because they're in a hurry and because they are angry. And they are angry at the boss. And they're angry at the 1%. And this is why we have the Occupy Wall Street group. These are spoiled brats who asked their mother for candy and their mother wouldn't give it to them. And now that they're grown up, they want to pick at Wall Street. And they want to get something they've never earned, never worked for, and certainly don't deserve. But it's a sign of the anger 
that we have in our society today. Interestingly enough, wolves consider anger to be empowering. And uh, anger to them is a demonstration of strength. And to not become angry is to be weak. But lambs know that true strength does not lie in rage, but in rest. Resting in peace in the Lord. Lambs know that true strength is not found in fury, but in forgiveness. And lambs know that true strength is not found in pride, but in patience. And wolves are committed to self-justification. Now, they may admit that they're not perfect, but they will say, I'm not too bad. And uh, wolves will say, I can take care of myself. And uh, wolves don't believe in absolutes. Uh, they believe in relativism. And there is no absolute right or wrong. It depends on the circumstances. And they use relativism as a license for their various behaviors. They say, I will not judge you, so don't you judge me for what I'm doing. I may not be perfect, but you're not perfect either. And so don't say anything about what I'm saying, thinking, or doing. Just leave me alone. I'm not a hypocrite because I don't pretend to be doing right. And this is typical of wolves. Uh, wolves want to be evil. They love senseless violence. I, I was so surprised this week to learn that the latest game that they've been waiting for at GameStop, they sold uh, more than a million copies in the first uh, day. The most violently realistic uh, war uh, kind of game that's possible. And we feed on this uh, kind of violence. Uh, people love senseless violence. And I've learned about that recently in, in my uh, sometimes job. I work part-time. And I have the privilege of, of uh, seeing uh, DART employees for da DART area, Dallas area rapid transit employees. And I was examining a fellow one day, and I said, and what do you do for DART? And he says, well, I uh, uh, work in the uh, garage. And I said, oh, in the garage. So you're you know, changing oil and uh, putting on brake pads and things like that. He says, no. He says, I reupholster seats. And I said, you reupholster seats? Why would you need to be reupholstered? I, I wouldn't think that'd be a full-time job. He says, oh, no, no. He says, people slash the seats with razors and with their knives. And so we have to, re he says, I have a crew that works with me. And I said, well, how many slash seats do you have? He says, we have about 150 a day. And this is an illustration of how much anger and hostility there is. And uh, earlier this week, I was examining a bus driver for Durham School Bus Services. And I said, you know, how, how is it being a Durham School Bus driver? And they said, oh, terrible. The kids are horrible. And they, they, they don't behave themselves. And if you discipline any of them, they'll tell their parents. The parents will call the school. The school will call the Durham people. And I get called in on the carpet. And I said, well, at least it's not like the dart buses where they slash up the seats because these kids can't carry knives or razors. He says, oh, no. He says, they tear up the seats all the time. And I said, well, how do they do that? He says, they think they're pencils, and they stab holes in the seats, and then they put their fingers in there, and then they rip the seats open. And I, I said, wow, you know, the same, the, the same thing. They learned it from their parents, uh, you know? And this is a sign of anger and the anger that there is and how they want to be wolves. So what's the solution? And what are lambs to do? And so uh, I want to just consider with you two or three things that lambs have to do that are unique to lambs that uh, we have to practice. And first off is that we need to realize that our deeds uh, speak louder than words. Now, there is a time to preach. There is a time to talk. There's a time to do Bible studies. But the truth is, you're walking around and interacting all day, every day. And the truth is, there should be a really sharp contrast between who you are and who the wolves are. So that when they see you acting and doing, they may say, whoa, there's something different about that person. That will preach a sermon. That will attract them. 
And there are several texts in that regard, and you might just jot them down because I'm going to read them quickly. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 2, where Paul says, You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. You are an epistle, and you are known and read of all men. And, uh, and in those days, they only had the written word. And, uh, and the truth is, uh, we have, and I'm just going to digress to talk about media a little bit. Now, we liked it when we had radios because it brought us the voice of a human, right? And then we liked it even better because we had TV because uh, TV gave us a black and white shadow of a human and we could see the voice and the facial expression. Then we had color TV and then we have life-size color TV and now we have life-size 3D TV, right? Well, now, you know, yeah, the only improvement they could make on that would be if you couldn't turn it off. You know, if it was just going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But think about it. That's what you are. You know, people can hear you when you talk. You're in full color. You are 3D. And you can't be turned off. <laughs> and, and so the truth is, media is approaching closer and closer to what you as a human are and what you have been all along. So, yes, I'm thankful for the TV ministry. And I hope that, you know, we'll reach many people through the TV ministry. But don't kid yourself, a real live person uh, sitting and standing and acting in front of you and talking to you that you can't turn off is a much more effective tool for ministry than anything we can put out on the airwaves. And so this is why when Paul says, you are an official known and read of all men, that's, that's just powerful. He should have said, you're also in color, you're 3D, and you can't be turned off. And then that makes you exceedingly compelling. The next text is 1 John 3.18. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So here John is saying, listen, I, what you say is nice, but hey, you know, you, indeed, you have to live a truthful life. And then Colossians 3.17, Paul says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we have to live it. That's what it takes to be a lamb. The, the second point that I want to make about lambs is that we must have an attitude of, of gratitude. And that, that will make a, a big difference. We live in an age of ingratitude. Uh, everybody in the world thinks the world owes them a living. And I, I am having a hard time because I've had some bad breaks. You know, things have not done, gone well uh, for me. And uh, the truth is we need to thank God for everything. And I have known people like that, and they've irritated me in the past. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, it, but they were doing the right thing. And I'm, I, you know... The typical thing is, hey, how are you doing? And they'll say, God's blessed me with a wonderful day. You know, is that the truth? That is the truth. And, and the truth is one of the best ways to tell people about God is to be thankful uh, about what God has, has done for you. Be thankful for your circumstances. Oh, I'm thankful. How things go at work today? I'm thankful that God gave me a wonderful job. And God is so good. That's thankfulness. Don't take credit to yourself. Thank God for your commodities. Thank God for your house. Thank God for your cars. Thank God for salvation. How are you doing today? I'm thankful that God saved me. And I'm, I'm thankful for that today. And so we need to cultivate that attitude of gratitude. Several texts, in, and we have hundreds we could use, but I like First Chronicles 16, 8, where it says, Give thanks to the Lord call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. So it says, give thanks to the Lord, but make known among the nations what he's done. See, that's the gospel commission. The gospel commission is to relate the thanks, be thanks to God, and then tell everybody about it. 
what God has done for you. Psalms 107, 15. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Yeah, God, anything that's happened to you, God has allowed it. You can be thankful for that. And um, I, I think that uh, Ephesians 5, 19 and 20 is good. It says, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Some can sing out loud, and we appreciate their songs. Some of us need to <coughs> sing in our hearts because our voices are kind of weak. Uh, but it says, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. Always giving thanks to God for everything. Amen. And that's, that's what we need to do. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so if things go bad, it's an opportunity to be witness for him. If you lose a job, it's an opportunity for God to show his strength for you. And so irrespective of what happens, in good or bad, give God thanks for everything. Uh, the third and, and last point that I want to make about uh, uh, lambs is that moral excellence must be a reality in our lives. We really have to live like saints. And that, that's not to say that we can be absolutely perfect and it, it doesn't mean that we don't need God's grace every day. We do need that. But the truth is the excellence of Christ should be reflected in you and the world should be able to see that and uh, they should be able to remark on that uh, difference and want to be that way themselves. Non-Christians are watching you. They're watching for hypocrisy and moral failing because they will readjust their behavior to the lowest standard that they can find. And if your life is a high standard of morality and you are a human being, then they have no excuse because they are challenged by that to be as good as you are. And uh, so they'll be watching you very carefully for problems that may come up. So you must decide to be a lamb. It must be a decision that you make for yourself. And it can't be a social decision because we all agreed to. It cannot be because family pressured you to be so. You must make that decision yourself because you want to be true and you want to live a real life. And committing yourself to Christ, and I just want to end with these thoughts here. A commitment to Christ is the most important commitment that you can make in life. It's more important than national citizenship. A lot of people are really proud because they became an American. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad they became Americans, but uh, it's better to be a Christian. And it, it'll mean more to you. And uh, being a Christian is more important than membership in a political party. It uh, doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat. Uh, be a Christian first and uh, then do your political stuff afterwards. It's more important than any social movement. It's more important than Occupy Wall Street. And strange to say this, but actually your commitment to God is more important than, than marriage because your commitment to God has to be stronger than your commitment to your spouse. Uh, and it's more important than your job, more important than money. Being a Christian is an all-encompassing faith that pervades and invades all of your life and being. So Jesus is sending us as lambs uh, to Crowley and through our TV ministry to the entire Dallas-Fort Worth uh, area. Let us remember that there are wolves out there, but it is Jesus who is sending us out there. And Jesus will give us the strength to do the work that needs to be done. And as we pray, he will send additional laborers to work with us in this endeavor. Let us be faithful to him until we see him come in the clouds of glory. And I would ask you to commit yourself to this. I'm not gonna ask you to stand or raise your hands because then you might be pressured for social reasons. But I would ask you to respond within your heart to this challenge. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, uh, you have sent us as lambs among wolves. 
and we recognize that we are surrounded by a hostile society that doesn't know you and doesn't want to know you. And we ask that you would help us to renew our commitment to you every day, and may we live our lives in such a way that those around us can really see the difference. And then may those who are honest in heart respond, and may they come.